I mean, it's definitely an exciting, I mean, it's not good exciting, it's bad exciting, but doing incident response is always, uh, it's a very stressful situation, but that's just the, that's the job, like that, that's what we sign up for, that's why we do it, right? It's not easy, but it's very important work, and it can really make a big difference um, to the trust of everyone that's associated with the company, because what I mean by that is, if you do incident response really well, in the event that there is something bad that happens, if you're extremely transparent about what happened and how and what was taken and why and like all the details, then people will be like, oh yeah, they kind of have their they have their stuff together. Like they actually at least understand how how it happened and they're going to bounce back from it. Jack Nagliari, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks, Jeff. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Should we start with a little um, overview of who you are? You've been on this podcast uh, twice already. Uh, your last episode was uh, republished a couple of months ago, but for listeners who haven't had a chance to catch up with that yet, do you want to give us an overview of um, who you are, your professional background, what you've been working on, what you're most interested in technology-wise, and then just for personality, one uh, non-technical hobby as well? Yeah, Absolutely. So my name is Jack. I am the founder and CEO of a cybersecurity company called Panther Labs, and or just Panther for short. And we are a cloud-based security monitoring platform that helps teams detect and respond to breaches quickly and intelligently. And I started the company after working in security for about 10 years and I worked as an incident responder, I worked as a lead forensic investigator, and then I transitioned into doing more software-oriented um, security monitoring, meaning deploying tools like OS Query and uh, doing syslog, logging, and all these, these um, plumbing that's just required in order to do security monitoring at scale. So did that as a practitioner for many years and then became a, a founder in 2018, and then Panther has been able to um, really take a lot of the learnings that I felt as a practitioner around um, ha having difficulty deploying tools that were just very slow and expensive and cumbersome and really building a platform that solves those challenges plus also builds for, for cloud-native companies and uh, to operate at a very high scale with a much lower cost and a lot of the, these other things. So if we could talk about the product more in depth and, and the platform that we've built but uh, that's the, the basic background on Panther. And then you want to get a little bit deeper with, with who I am. Uh, I always think it's a funny question. Like, who are you? Like, who are you actually? Uh, because there's this, there's this persona that we have that's like outward facing. And then there's like the actual like depths of like who people actually are, like what they do. So uh, to not get super deep right off the bat, uh, I'll just kind of give a quick background. Uh, from the D.C. area, Moved out to San Francisco about 10 years ago. Uh, it's kind of crazy to say that, but I came out here when I was just a, a kid in his early 20s trying to figure out his career and then ended up um, working at Yahoo for about four years and then working at Airbnb for about three years and then um, really just diving headfirst into the startup world, building a company to solve a problem that I was feeling and raised venture capital, built a team, got some great customers, rinsed, repeat, keep going, you know, just stay focused on the mission, keep building your team. Really, uh, you have to be very dynamic as a, as a founder just in order to survive. Yeah. Things have to change every single six months, every 12 months, like it's always evolving. So I think as a human, I'm kind of like that as well. I like to evolve in a lot of different ways. Uh, health is a very important thing to me, mental health, physical health, uh, diet, nutrition, exercise, like all these things I've gone very, very deep into. And then, obviously, around company building and learning all those fundamentals uh, was was definitely uh, a journey, and it still is a journey. Like I'm always learning, and I don't think I'm ever going to stop learning. It's more so of like, what am I learning now, and what is applicable to me now? And I think that's an important element of um, just just being a good human. It's right. It's like, how are you helping the people around you, and how yeah. are you making progress in the important things in your life. And like, those are the things that I care about separate yeah. from my company. So, so as, as someone health aware, nutrition aware, who's also very technical, do you do any of the quantified self stuff like um, 
measuring or counting calories or uh, protein intake or steps and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. A, a favorite yeah, have, gadget as well or favorite app. For sure. So I, I do I do a lot of those things. I'm trying to do a little bit less of it, to be honest, because I think it can just be too much sometimes. So I, I was dabbling with levels yeah. for a while. Like the glucose monitoring, I thought was super interesting, and the effects of glucose on your overall health was really fascinating to me. Um, honestly, just sleep tracking and overall activity tracking. So I use a Whoop. Shout out to Whoop. And then, uh, yeah, levels Whoop. And then uh, Viome as well. So Viome is like gut microbiome analysis. I've done a lot of that. Um, use my fitness pal for macros, things like that. I don't track macros as closely as I used to. I think it's kind of an unhealthy habit to a degree. It can be effective if you're a bodybuilder, but if you're just mm. trying to live, live a normal life, it's just it's a lot of mental overhead and causes a lot more stress than I think does good versus just focusing on hitting important goals and not... Uh, like like just being intentional about your your eating habits and kind of going aside from that, but I I don't think it's worth uh, obsessing over. I think it actually can be quite detrimental to your mental health if you obsess over it yeah. too much. To stray away from the scientific a tiny bit, like my gran always says, if you feel like eating chocolate, you should eat it because it's your body telling you you need it. <laughs> yeah, so. that's wise. That's uh, wise words. <laughs> yeah, wisdom of the my wisdom of the generations. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I was at my grandma's house once and uh, she's an older Italian woman. And uh, I'm like, Grandma, I'm not hungry. She's like, You don't have to be hungry to eat. Just eat. <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah. Mine says, uh, La <laughs> yes, petite dans ton mangeant, i.e., start eating and you'll be hungry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I suppose if you, if you right away at a, quite the onset of your career uh, start, uh, investing all your time into a startup that doesn't necessarily leave you much time for any other non technical non technical uh, hobbies in that way. Yeah, that's correct. I think the <laughs> perennial problem as a founder is doing too much. So I'm actively yeah. trying not to do so much. I'm actively yeah, trying yeah. to do less. Actually, the power of saying no. So Absolutely. yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't do really anything else that's technical. This is all I think about now. So tell me about Panther. Why, what's the, I suppose, uh, they always talk about unique selling point, but let's frame the question in a, maybe a bit more of a novel way. Um, what is the thing that Panther solves that was a problem before it existed? Mm -hmm. Is there a specific yeah. problem, a specific technology, or is it Absolutely. more just bringing everything into one platform so you don't need, like you alluded to before, uh, a million disparate tools. So the, the tool problem in security has been around for a long time. And I think if you just ask any security leader what, why they hate SIMS, so SIM is an acronym that we use, means security info and event management. It's basically just a dumping ground for your security logs. And the whole, the whole purpose of a SIM is to uh, allow people to take in all that signal and make sense of it, right? We need to understand the things going on so the SIM is effectively like your, uh, your, your control center that gives you an overview of your entire environment. Think of it like you're monitoring a building and, and the SIM receives all the camera footage. It's like the same thing. Same idea, right? So the problems in the past were they required just, they were just too, too heavy to deploy, there's too much overhead, they were too expensive, they didn't allow people to get the data that they wanted because they were poorly designed, and then they were just too cost prohibitive. So that, that was always the baseline problem. So when we built Panther, our whole goal was we, we want people to have the ability to send all of their data at any scale, like no matter what it is, and not be bogged down by cost of getting the, the data in. And we were able to solve that by building a cloud-native platform that um, was also backed by a data lake. So structured data is really the way that you can create these like more sustainable data pipelines. And it's not a new concept. It's been around for a very long time. And it's become even more popular in the last five years. But when we built the first version of Panther in 2018, around there, these things were still kind of new. 
right? Like in the mid 2010s is when data lakes started to become a thing. Like I think Amazon Athena went GA in like 2016 or 2017. It was pretty early. And then Snowflake has been around for a long time, but it's been gaining a lot of popularity as well. And Snowflake is a cloud data warehouse that is their whole sole purpose is just to build a cloud data warehouse. And it's effectively a data lake that is highly optimized, highly performant, and has like a bunch of rich features and things like that. So when we built Panthers, the, the baseline is strong technology because you can't do anything without data. Like you need security data to do anything related to incident response, which is detecting behaviors that are, um, that are potentially bad and then more importantly, being able to quickly respond when you know something is bad and it has happened. And you might find out about that after the fact. You might be proactively monitored about that. Uh, you might get a page or someone might tell you you're breached. Like, hey, dude, someone just posted all your logins on Pastebin. Like, you should probably go figure that out. And then as the IR team, it's your job to go back and say, okay, tell me everything that happened. Tell me, you know, no, with the few clues that I have, help me problem solve and work backwards to be like, okay, how did this happen? And you, you're effectively playing the crime scene investigator, but yeah, for security. Yeah, I was going to so, say, it makes for a good TV show, but it's not necessarily what you want in a professional setting. I mean, it's definitely an exciting, I mean, it's not good exciting, it's bad exciting, but doing incident response is always, uh, it's a very stressful situation, but that's just the, that's the job. Like, that, that's what we sign up for. That's why we do it, right? It's not easy. But it's very important work, and it can really make a big difference um, to the trust of everyone that's associated with the company. Because what I mean by that is if you do incident response really well, in the event that there is something bad that happens, if you're extremely transparent about what happened and how and what was taken and why and like all the details, then people will be like, oh, yeah, they kind of have their, they have their stuff together. Like They actually at least understand how, how it happened, and they're going to bounce back from it. Because it's not security. always the security team's fault of like, oh, yeah, they should have done this better. And like, sure, there's always ways that you can make security better, right? But I think the important thing is how you respond. And if you're able to quickly respond and plug the holes that exist and then reprioritize things that you maybe should have done a quarter ago, that, that does go a long way in, in building trust again and just saying like, hey, this was a mistake and et cetera, et cetera. Because even if you do every control correctly, there's always a way in. There's always something there's that always can go wrong. In. And yeah. I, I don't think it's worth beating yourself up about it because it's pretty inevitable. Like if someone if someone has enough willpower and resources, like they could probably figure it out. And your job is to make it really hard for them to figure out, right? And then if they do yeah. figure it out, you see that they figured it out and then you're proactive and reactive enough. So it's a really interesting cat and mouse game of security. And our whole premise is we want a platform that allows people to get all the visibility that they care about, have a really clever way of, of, of analyzing that data. So we use Python as our, as our basis. So imagine like Python scripting on logs is basically what Panther is. And then when you do your response, you're able to just pick a date and time, like really anywhere in the spectrum. So for example, if this thing happened like a year or two, a year or two ago, you can be like, okay, I want to search the entire month of June 2018, and I want to go. That has never been possible in logging platforms, at least easily. It's been a very, very large pain, and that to me is the baseline of what we're doing in Sim. If you can't do that, then you're fundamentally crippling yourself from the beginning. And then on top of that is now how do we get even more creative with detecting um, potentially bad behaviors? And there's a whole slew of things we could do there. And then in response, which is how can we very quickly tell the story of what happened in, in an incident? And those are the things now that, that we're focused on at Panther is like how do we bring this overall process of security operations into product so people don't have to reason about what are the things that they should be doing? Because security is one of those things that's very hard to learn because if you don't ever have an incident, you're not going to ever learn those things. Yeah. And that tends to be really the only way you learn it. So we can use the knowledge that we've created and um, in a mass over multiple years of doing this internally, we can like build that into the product. So yeah, and that I, ends up I, being I, like I a very helpful element. Yeah. And you do offer a lot of, of those kind of pre-baked uh, bite-sized solutions. We'll, we'll dig into all of that um, in a minute. Uh, you use the term data lake and also the term data warehouse. Um, 
how would you explain the difference? What makes something a data lake and not a data warehouse and or vice versa? A data warehouse is typically structured. A data lake, and, and by the way, I'm not a data expert. Um, I'm not a like data engineer. So someone could, someone listening might be like, oh, well, technically this is the difference. <laughs> um, well, actually. But a data, a data lake can be structured or unstructured. It doesn't necessarily mean it's structured. A data warehouse is a very, very highly scalable database that's structured, structured data. So in but a data lake, you can drop can unstructured data. That's in... so, sorry, say it again. Uh, from what I remember, a data warehouse can be sparse, which is what makes it different from a database because a database is, of course, structured, but every field is meant to have a value unless it's explicitly null. Whereas from what I remember, a data warehouse can have entries that are half blank. So it's still structured, but it can also be sparse inside. Does that ring true? Mm, I, I don't really know if that's like the main difference. I mean, I know that in a data lake, data can be in a lot of different formats. The whole idea is it's a highly dynamic storage area for your data. And then... If it's structured, you structure it, and then you're able to query it at rest, etc. Right? Like data data lakes, I feel like are a little bit more like um, they can query the data as it stands in some blob storage like S3. Data warehouses have to be preloaded, and they're meant to be yeah, highly optimized right. and highly structured. Whereas a data lake is a bit more unstructured and has a little bit more flexibility. But the the line gets blurred these days because of tech like Snowflake, but Snowflake refers to himself as a cloud data warehouse. So I think in, in a sense, uh, that's effectively what we're dealing with. Because we're not, we're not dealing with unstructured data that often because there's a lot of performance hits from unstructured data. For example, it's very common in security to just take a random string and drop it in a search box and be like, tell me what this is. But that just doesn't work at scale. Like It just simply doesn't work. It's super slow, e- even with... You know, a month's worth of data in something like an Elastic or a Splunk, it's it's very painful to do that process. So I think fundamentally as security teams, we have to get better at understanding our data and making sure that we are on board of, of structuring it and putting it into a, a data warehouse, which is an implementation detail that we take care of, by the way. There's nothing that the teams have to do in order to um, manage a data warehouse. It's all about uh, are we parsing it out correctly and are the fields showing up and Everything else is taken care of by us as a SaaS service. So that's another yeah. key part of this whole thing, which is security teams should not be bogged down by deploying their own tools. And they should just run SaaS as much as they can unless they have a very, very hard regulatory compl- uh, requirement that tells them that they can't do that, which I feel like is becoming rarer every year. So does Panther take care of categorizing data if there is some... Uh, unstructured data, or, or I suppose rather data with an unknown structure uh, being ingested into Panther. Uh, does Panther make an opinionated decision in order to structure it? And is there any danger uh, in terms of miscategorization uh, that you had to consider? So w- we almost never want teams to have to think about this. The only time they should have to think about it is if they're bringing in custom internal data that is its own format that's unique to your business. And then even at that point, we have a generation tool that will look at your data, it will imply the schema, and then you just make small adjustments to it, and then you're good to go. But besides so customers that, are I, able, I, customers are able to yeah. dictate the structure if they want to, but the key is they don't have to. Right, exactly. That makes sense. So they, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's typically pretty, uh, pretty much like at the same data sources, and then you know, like everyone's doing CloudTrail and all the AWS ones, and then certain SaaS things like Okta and G Suite. Like this is all very common, right? And I think yeah, that's of course, kind if of the where format things are is known things. beforehand. Then, yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, we the, we're the monitoring Panther it as well. Does right. emphasize. Uh, structure a lot and it also says mm-hmm. that um, you're able to run queries over terabytes of data in minutes whereas it used mm-hmm. to take 
days or weeks or months beforehand. So is this structure in the data, is that the key to that? Uh, so I just want to make a quick like correction. It wouldn't take like weeks or Absolutely. months. I just Please want always. people to be framed in the right way. Like usually <laughs> how it worked before. It's, it's one or two ways, right? It's like it either you can do it or you can't do it at all. So for example, if it's like, oh, it happened six months ago, it's very it was very binary. It's like, do we even have the data? Yes or no? And usually it was no, because no, six months was really hard to achieve at scale. And then um, after that, it's like, cool, how long is it going to take to get an answer? And then you have to run a query, and then you hope that you ran it right, and then that you got the data back that you got, right? So it's, it's a very uncertain process. And by using Cloud Data Warehouse, you, you obviously still have performance that you have to take into account, right? You can't just select star from everything if you have like 50 petabytes <laughs> of logs. Like, in your, like you still have to be smart about it, right? Like you have to be, you have to be very uh, intentional with like what you're looking for. And it's our job as a vendor to make that process even easier. So people don't have to think about like, well, then do I look in a window of time? Do I just search everything? Like, no, I don't I don't want people to have to think like that. I want it literally to just be like, this is an, an indicator that I care about. I want to find more information about it. Panther help me figure it out. Right. Like that's what I want. And those are the workflows that we're that we're investing in right now with response and uh, on the detection side as well. It's like it's how can we analyze our data in a way that um, allows people to look for very common behaviors across a lo- large v- variety of logs, correlate between them, uh, either in detection and response, things like that. Um, so the the way that searching over data becomes possible is sort of two ways. Like The first way is we analyze everything as it streams in real time. So the rules are operating on the logs as it's coming across, and there's actually a lot of efficiency benefits to this. Because if you're always having to query the data warehouse... For like a whole day, constantly, it tends to be less efficient and a bit slower because the data has to come in and there's a lag time. It has to get indexed and then you can run a search. In real time, you don't have to wait for that. It just happens, happens right away. There's actually also another process too. If you actually really want to join the data or something like that, then you can uh, feed it back through the the Python streaming rules. Uh, with what we call a scheduled query, which is basically runs a SQL statement, passes it back through your rules. It's the same thing. So Snowflake is really the way that we're able to achieve the data scale, but there's a lot of work that we've done in Lambda in making sure that you can actually process that that scale of data as it goes up and down. And the beauty of serverless is it is highly dynamic, and you don't really have to think as much about uh, capacity planning and things like that because the underlying services scaling up and down as you need it. So that's been very, very beneficial for having customers that send upwards of you know, like 50 terabytes of data per day. And we're able to handle yeah. that because we've built a really strong architecture that allows you to, to actually stream, analyze that data, and process it and put it into the data lake. So those typically uh, are very hard to build and maintain. And this is just a baseline that we've done for all of our customers. So you sort of and get you said you can also achieve Not retentions. Free, you, know you, you said you can Sorry, also achieve again. retention periods of uh, up to six months or even beyond uh, with that amount yeah. of data. Easy. Do you, do you, is the data all still there in its entirety or do you do some sort of reducing resolution where less important data gets deleted over time so that it, you can go no. further back and it gets more spots? So it's all there all the time. Mm-hmm. It's all there all the time, yeah. And then there's obvious benefits and, and costs to that, right? I mean, you're paying for the storage, but um, it's not. It, it's fairly cheap to store data. But regardless, there's definitely been a desire to want to filter. And people, for example, there's some network logs that are just useless where they have no security value and honestly no operational value either. They're just kind of data. So there's been the desire there to filter by some means, and people have asked for us to build that feature as well. And uh, in the meantime, people are just being more clever with how they filter their data. But so, sometimes you can, can do the data directly. Sometimes yeah. There must be some compliance requirements as well that you can't keep customer data for more than seven years or something like that, I, I imagine. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. The queries you run... Um, you mentioned select, select star from everything. 
So I saw some SQL snippets on the Panther website. Is that actual SQL or is it an SQL-like proprietary or domain-specific language? No, it's, I mean, today it's just Snowflake's uh, version of SQL. But yeah, that's... we're in the process of making a, a non-SQL version right now. So you don't have to learn SQL necessarily and understand the layouts of the tables and the databases. Like that was never, that never was meant to be a long-term interface to our data. It was really more so a technical foundation that was just required in order to operate at that scale. Yeah, and then yeah, of course. on top of that is how do we just make sure that people can tell the story of an incident very fast and that's really what we're focused on building now. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was interested in the trade-offs because of course SQL, um, the basics of SQL, I think everybody knows, but SQL can quickly right. become incredibly complex, especially if you take performance and data volume into account. So there's always the interesting trade-off of do I want people to learn SQL or do I try to do something else? But then do people need to retrain because a lot of people already have good SQL knowledge and will my specific language have all the features and, and so on? Um, so be interesting to yeah, see. I think it's, I think it's less about like how how hard SQL is. because you can, you can make the same argument with Python. I think it's more so True. how much mental overhead is there for me to achieve what I need to achieve, and how do we draw how do we draw that down as much as possible? That's what that's what I'm concerned with right now. So yeah. so so you'll have a I'm biased, updates. obviously. <laughs> um, so you said that you're working on uh, on something. So it'd be interesting uh, in a in a couple of months, hopefully, to have you back on the show to see if there's an an update about that. Yeah, yeah. Just follow us. Just follow our uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, website, um, things like that. Will do. It's probably the so one. to come back to what makes Panther Panther and what distinguishes it from other CMs, um, the analogy came to my mind of a plain cockpit. So if as a layman I go and sit mm -hmm. in a plain cockpit, I have indicators and switches and displays everywhere. And I'm sure that they all have their use, but as a layman, I'll, I'll be quickly overwhelmed. And I imagine that traditional CMs probably grew like that because there were additional feature requests and they probably evolved with some eventually quite senior staff who then had time over their whole career to learn all of the interface. But now if I, if I get on board it, I'll be overwhelmed. And I, I won't know what half of them do. So is it a good analogy to say that Panther basically gives me fewer but more relevant controls, whereas while still giving me all the features that I could need. So if I am actually a huge organization that really needs all the different indicators and all the different switches, then Panther will give me that. But if I'm just... Um, a very small company that only uses one or two cloud-based products. I have a much smaller, but much more pertinent to me dashboard. So I think the analogy that I, that I tend to use is just thinking about the animal, right? Like the company is named after the animal for a reason. And the reason is that we wanted to build something that was super sleek, super fast and very protective. And that's how I like to explain the platform, where real-time analytics allows you to respond very quickly, feed into automation systems, take action right away. The speed element also comes out in the fact that we can search through large swaths of data quickly, and that's always going to continue to get better. And we, uh, we plan to always try to reduce that time as much as possible for incident responders. And... Yeah, I think the protective element is just in the capabilities that we have today and are going to continue to evolve around detection of, of uh, not, I hate to say breaches, right, because it's so binary. But I like to say behaviors that could be leading to a breach or an incident. I also think sims make the mistake of saying, like, run our sim and we'll find your breach. It's like, hmm it's pretty hard to find a breach and you actually could go your whole career in security and never find one. 
And I just hate to use that in marketing of like, oh yeah, you're, you're going to find the breach with this. And it's kind of like how I feel about other security companies that they're like, you know, our mission is to have zero breaches. It's like, that's not really a great mission because your customers are going to have breaches. It's kind of unavoidable. <laughs> so it's more of like, how do you, how do you help them stay as proactive or reactive to that? You know, it's not so much like we're going to stop it from happening. It's like, no one's going to stop it from happening. You know, it's always going to happen unless you just turn all the computers off and put them in a closet somewhere. You're always going to have someone exploiting something. You know, it's inevitable. So um, I like to think of Panther as like a trusted companion, like someone who's there with you, helping you through your incident response lifecycle, through, you know, like making sure that uh, you're able to get your, your own objectives done as a defender in disrupting what attackers are working on. And that's really... That's really what success is to me. And if we're able to do that and keep our, our customers happy and continue evolving our platform and make their, their jobs easier, like then we've succeeded. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, competing analogies then. Um, I'm, in, I'm interested in the, uh, the integrations. So I've seen that there are a lot of popular um, software solutions, software maybe not the right word, maybe stack or technology, uh, anything from Slack to um, S3 hosting to anything. So um, I suppose that does make the onboarding easier. We talked before about uh, the structure of data and the categorization of the different fields in the in the different log formats. So for anything that is known to Panth already, that will be uh, trivial, uh, a non, non-task for, for the customer and um, easily able to, or at least def- definitely able to, to be figured out by Panther. Does this also translate into uh, the, the dashboard? I, I assume there is some sort of um, dashboard that I, where I can see uh, relevant metrics or um, behaviors, like you said, that could, uh, that could be of concern. Is there some sort of... Um, flashy dashboard that will appeal to to uh, to, to managers and, and salespeople um, that is adapted depending on the integration that uh, or integrations that I have chosen with Panther. Uh, so, I mean, is there a flashy dashboard? The answer is no. Uh, I don't, I'm not a big fan of flashy dashboards because I don't think they really mean anything. So... They usually don't, <laughs> but like, like I said, they often, comment, they often... But... Play, they often uh, um, appeal to the people who, who hold the purse strings, but um, in my opinion, yeah. it's the mark of a mature right. company if you sure. don't pander to that. <laughs> oh, for sure. But I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is like I'm a little bit more focused on effective security right now than I am on just showing a like flashy dashboard that doesn't mean anything. Because I think a lot of sims do this, where they'll they'll show you like the number of unique IP addresses you have, and it's like who cares. Why does that matter? <laughs> like, why is that security relevant? You know, there's a lot of things like that I've seen that just don't really add value. And I'd rather be very intentional about what we're showing and why we're showing it. So, you started the question around um, uh, what's it called uh, integrations. So, yeah, I mean, we support we support all the data wherever it is. We try to we try to have as as much breadth and depth as we can. There's obviously always going to be that long tail that isn't supported, but we try to cover the most important and, and severe like log sources or, or critical log sources, I should say, instead of severe, like Okta and G Suite and these things that are either identity-oriented or um, are platform-oriented, like GCP, AWS, Kubernetes, these types of things. And as long as people have that visibility into it, into those systems at any scale, then that's a really strong win. And then from there, like, yeah, we have dashboards that show like the amount of data throughput that we have and the you know, stats on alerts and things like that. Um, but we're a little bit more focused right now on capability and being able to interface with the data easier and more effectively and being able to um, add additional capabilities around how that data gets analyzed. So, for example, we have... Uh, the ability to enrich that data as it streams. So you can do threat intelligence matching, you can do arbitrary key value matching as well. 
and then you can use the value of that in your detection. So an example, real world example is uh, IP info or gray noise or like some threat intelligence uh, integration that we support. If you have an IP in that log, you can match it against against gray noise and IP info, and then you can add additional logic in your rule that says, oh, and if gray noise thinks it's malicious and it, IP info says it's not from this country or something kind of like this, you can just add additional logic and then you whittle down the amount of potential false positives that could exist. And then there's other things you can do a little bit more clever. We can do things like caching, uh, caching certain um, values as it streams. We can keep counts, dynamic counts of things. You can do a lot more uh, clever, a little bit more technical uh, analysis things. And that is really, that's really the ultimate goal is to reduce false positives, right? Like that's, that's ultimately what we're trying to achieve. And we're trying to orient ourselves in the right way and look at the right signal. So that's where I'm more focused versus just having a dashboard. Because I think the world is sort of evolving away from dashboards anyway. Uh, we we want to get to a place where things are mostly just working in the background and we respond when we need to. But otherwise, we we have good rules and good logic and good software that's running that's making our lives a lot easier and allowing us to just focus on the things that matter so you have intelligent enrichment so the data doesn't get enriched unconditionally but you can say like you said this seems possibly suspicious to me so then i want to enrich it and then with the enriched data i want to do a uh, real-time analysis on it that seems... It's the other way around. So everything's proactively enriched if you if you set it so. So if you say like, okay, I want to add this enrichment to this source, or as it's streaming across, you say I want to create a rule that's looking at that's enriching my log, and then I'm checking the value of that enrichment. Because oftentimes you'll do joins against a database for something like HR or uh, something that's threat intelligence oriented. You might have your own internal lists and you might have your own your own internal ma mappings that are relevant. For example, like an account mapping is such a common one where you'll say, um, this is my production account, this is my developer account, I care more about my prod account even though you, know, you still want to look at your dev account, but the prod account is the one where your customer data lives, it's where your production environment is, it's a little bit more important was yeah yeah especially yeah. when it comes to to incidents um production usually takes um takes uh, priority uh all right so looking at my list of questions uh i think we've covered a good amount of ground already uh, i wanted to talk a bit about snowflake so we've established that they are a data lake uh although they call themselves a, a data warehouse um, their their data work, cloud data warehouse. Yeah. Why choose Snowflake? So you partner with Snowflake and you use Snowflake as uh, your your own data storage. So you you will also mm -hmm. uh, be able to cater to customers who use Snowflake for themselves. But it's also yeah, a storage solution that you have uh, opted for. Um, right. Why? I suppose open ended question. Um, what makes Snowflake so much more uh, attractive or competitive to other solutions than than what just in general to other data um, data warehousing or data lake uh, solutions yeah I think it was just a order of maturity for us when we first got introduced to Snowflake they had a serverless offering meaning you didn't have to deploy any infrastructure and that was a huge thing for us and then the performance mm -hmm. of the data warehouse was just so much more um, high than it was in other platforms that we were trying at the time. So it was really just a performance, deployment, and cost thing. And we just fundam fundamentally aligned with them as an organization about how we're going to help mobilize the, the world's data. Right, I think that's their mission. And that was just really helpful for us early on. And uh, I had I had my, my first like, oh shit moment with them when I saw a query that scanned te terabytes of data just happened in a few seconds. I was like, whoa, that's that's good tech. And there's that a lot of things they built in their platform around resizing warehouses and 
and things like that. They, they build additional optimizations. They're going to keep shipping new things. So it's like their core mission is just to do this. And we didn't really see any other option at that time that was better. Uh, there's obviously a, a handful of new ones now that have come out, but I think we're very we're very invested in Snowflake, and we built a strong relationship with them. And then, as you as you also pointed out, if if you do have an existing Snowflake cluster, it's actually very easy to work with us in that regard as well. So we we're very close with Snowflake, and we can uh, partner to figure out a structure where the warehouse is still owned by your organization, and we feed into it. So that that flow has worked quite well. It does sound like you are uh, on the same wavelength as companies by focusing on the core of your mission and also the mantra of, uh, you say, your customers shouldn't have to worry about, you know, onboarding or managing infrastructure for the product that you're offering. And then you actually right. hold Snowflake to the same mantra. I'm like, I don't want to worry about the operations of this. I just want to use the solution. Right. And um, yeah, it sounds Shared like... responsibility. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, good, cool. Um, so one of the most interesting and um, intriguing features of Panther is detection as code. So we've already talked mm. about it a little. Uh, it's in Python. Uh, it can be real time. There can be scheduled queries. Um, right. Is this a new thing in uh, in, in security in CMs, it seems quite yeah. It's definitely a new thing for CM. Yeah, sorry. There's, there's it's definitely a new thing in the sim, and we've started to see more adoption just in the community about this. So we were really the first ones who started using like the style of real time Python based analysis that we have, and there's a ton of benefits to it. One, Python's a familiar language that most security teams know. And if you have the ability to code, it's probably nine times out of ten in Python or in Bash. But do we do Bash anymore? I don't really know. I would say Python is probably the standard, at least since since I was a practitioner. And the beauty with Python is it's a full Turing complete language. You don't have to do any hacks to do basic list lookups. It's very intuitive. You can test it. You can deploy it through your CI/CD pipelines. You can um, you can ensure that over time as well that you retain the integrity of your detection with those tests. But I think importantly, it just grants a lot of freedom and expression of what you're actually looking for. And I would say that it's it's quite an upgrade from what we had before, and it's fairly easy to learn. There's not a lot of technical depth required to really be successful in it. And the amount of expression and flexibility you get out of it is totally worth that investment. So it's effectively just Python on structured data. So on dictionaries and lists right. and strings and maybe date fields and numbers. There's no no complex libraries people have to learn, uh, no complex new new logic or operators. It's it's no, quite it's very close basic. to vanilla Python, probably with just a library to interface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's vanilla, vanilla Python plus a lot of helpers that we've created that make the typical patterns in logging just a lot easier. But a smooth learning curve. It's I'm biased. I've been doing it for <laughs> even before Panther. I've been doing detection as code on logs, so. I think for me, I'm super, super biased to, to say, yeah, it's easy. But you know, I also came from the world of using other popular sims, and there's there's always a slight curve when you're upping the technical intensity of your team. But uh, if you're able as a vendor to lower that bar to where they get the benefits without needing to know maybe all of the technical foundations, then I think you've succeeded. But I think the reality is, is there's not there's not enough security people to do the job. So the more that we focus on reducing that barrier, the better. Fair game to admit that you're biased. I think we all often are, but uh, loath to admit it. Um, yeah, so detection as code, you can write your rules in Python. And uh, yeah. I have to admit, I my heart skipped a beat when I read about CI, CI-CD pipelines and making it testable and making it reproducible. 
uh, that it, my background is is DevOps is a lot of uh, deployment mm. and CI CD uh, and 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 the fact that I can apply um, the same set of rules maybe with you know different conditions in my different environments I can test them I can have automated tests mm-hmm. when I change them to see if you know something broke that is I think uh, a hugely mature way of approaching anything uh, honestly as soon as you append as code to anything i'm almost immediately sold you can collaborate using git you can have you can have right. um peer reviews which is obviously immensely important as soon as something's to do with security again but uh, tell me a bit about how to test this uh how do i trigger a test is there mock data is there uh, the ability for people to have their own custom events um, in their mm-hmm. environment uh, before. Yeah, uh, you can step you through it. Yeah. Basically, it's you can give a sample log, and then you can say, given that this log happens, I want to know that an alert would get triggered. And you okay. can do this for a bunch of different test test cases, and that's where the reliability comes from, and the in the consistency of your rules comes from. And then, as you point out, yeah, you can get peer review, you can store it in GitHub, and yeah. you can do all these other great things. And uh, that, I think, helps a lot with compliance because you need to have a record of your detections. It helps with just up-leveling the quality as well of your program. And yep. it gives a record and version control of things that have changed in the past. So there's a ton of benefits to it, for sure. Strongly agree. Jack Nagliari, thank you so much for being on the show today. And uh, yeah, like we said, we, we look forward to having you again when um, when you've got any exciting new things to talk about. Yeah, I appreciate it, Jeff. And if anyone listening wants to get started with Panther and, and really try out some of these things that I was talking about with logging, ingestion, and, and play around with some Python-based rules and and uh, see the data as it, as it lives in a data warehouse structured um, you can you can go try a Panther trial actually for free right now. Just go to panther.com and uh, we have a try Panther button on the top. So uh, give it a whirl and uh, let us know what you think. Sounds really cool. I just wish I had a product to try it with. <laughs> All right, take care. Well, thanks for having me on, Jeff. Appreciate it.